Well, good morning, dear friends. Uh, thank you for joining us for our worship service today on this beautiful Sabbath. Uh, today we're going to continue our study on righteousness by faith and the final conflict. I'm going to take a few moments just to review what we studied last time, and then we'll get into new material. However, before we begin, we do want to have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless us as we study His Word. So please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you with humility. At the same time, we come boldly because we come in the name of Jesus. We ask that you'll be with us as we open your holy word, that it might not return unto you void or empty, but that it will accomplish that for which you sent it. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, and we know that you have heard this prayer, and you will answer according to your will, because we ask it in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's just review what we studied last time. Our central verse of study in this series is Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Now, this is in the context of the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. By this time, probation has closed for the world. So you say, what is Revelation 16, 15 doing there in the midst of the sixth plague if probation is closed? Well, the answer is that verse 15 takes us back to probationary time, warning us to be ready when the time of the sixth plague comes. Now let's read that verse. It's found in Revelation 16, verse 15. Jesus is speaking and he says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Six elements that we're studying in this verse. Jesus coming as a thief. The importance of watching. What does it mean to keep? What are the garments? What does it mean to walk naked? And what does it mean when it speaks about people seeing his shame? Now, we noticed last time that this message applies especially to Seventh-day Adventists. And we know that because there are similar expressions in the message of Jesus to the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. There it also speaks about having white garments, and not allowing people to see the shame of our nakedness. And so this message of Revelation 16, verse 15, applies especially to Seventh-day Adventists. We also noticed that uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18 is speaking about a shaking among God's people. We read a statement from Ellen White where she states, that those who reject the message to the church of, of Laodicea are going to be spewed out of the mouth of Jesus or are going to be shaken out. That's how important this message to the church of Laodicea and also the message of Revelation 16 verse 15 is to those who live on the earth today. Now, once again, I want to emphasize that Revelation 16, verse 15, is a parenthetical statement. It's telling us, when the time of the sixth plague comes, make sure that in probationary time, you heed the message of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. So verse 15 is not occurring in the context of the sixth plague. It's warning those who are uh, getting ready for the second coming of Jesus that they need to prepare now so that if they're, if they're uh, alive during the period of the sixth plague, they are not caught by surprise. Now we notice also that there are two gatherings spoken of in Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14. It speaks about three evil spirits like frogs going out, going out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to gather the whole world on the side of Satan. And we notice that the three angels message of Revelation chapter 14 refers to three 
unfallen holy angels that are gathering the world on God's side. So there are two gatherings. One gathering is the wicked for Armageddon, and the other gathering is God's people in spiritual Jerusalem. And we notice that Ellen White applied verses 13 and 14 of Revelation 16 to the gathering that takes place before the close of probation as well. Now last time we also studied uh, the first three points in this verse, Revelation 16 verse 15. We notice what it means that Jesus is coming as a thief. That does not re refer to the second coming of Christ. The coming of Jesus as a thief is the closing of the door of probation. Just like the door of probation closed for the antediluvian world when the door closed. In other words, uh, it was not the destruction that caught everybody a surprise. It was the closing of the door of the ark. Likewise, in Sodom and Gomorrah, the door was closed before the destruction actually came. So when Jesus says, I come as a thief, he's saying, be ready for the close of probation. Now, the close of probation has two meanings. There's an individual close of probation. If I should die today, my probation is closed. However, there is a corporate end time close of probation for the entire world. And so we need to be ready every moment of every day because probation might close at the moment of death. But if we're alive, when probation closes for the world, we need to have paid heed to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 so that we can be ready for the events that occur under the sixth plague. Last time we also studied, besides Jesus coming as a thief, we also study what it means to watch. Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief, therefore watch. We notice that watching means to be awake. It means to be alert. It means to be aware of everything that is happening in the world, the signs of the times that indicate that prophetic events are taking place so that at every moment we can be awake and watching and getting ready for the coming of Christ and the close of probation. Now also we noticed what the word uh, keeping means, keep your garments. We noticed in our study last time that keeping, the word keeping, means to preserve. It means to keep your garments clean. In other words, it's a process. It's not something that happens once upon a time. You receive the white garments and your garments are white forever. No, you have to make sure that you keep the garments clean. Uh, we also noticed in our study, and let me just give you three examples where uh, the Bible talks about keeping, uh, which means basically safeguarding, protecting, or preserving the white garment that God gave you initially. We mentioned uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, where he says at the end of his life, I have kept the faith. In other words, I have persevered in the faith. I have preserved the faith all through the course of my life since my conversion. We also notice that in Ephesians 4, 3, the Apostle Paul told us that we are supposed to be, or we're supposed to keep unity in the church. That means that uh, unity needs to be preserved constantly and continually in the church. And then we also notice Jude 6, where we're told that the rebel angels did not keep their place in heaven. In other words, the, for a while they were up there, they were faithful to the Lord, but they did not preserve their position. They did not protect their position. They did not safeguard their position. In other words, they were cast out from heaven because they did not persevere and preserve what they had. Now, we reviewed then what we studied last time, and let's get into new material now. Let's talk about the white garments and walking naked. It's vitally important to remember that Revelation 16 and verse 15 draws a contrast between being clothed and walking naked. Now, the big question is, what does the word walk mean, symbolically speaking? Because this is not talking about 
walking from here to the store or walking from here home. It is a figurative word, the word walk. What does it mean? Well, the Bible uses the word walk in a figurative sense to refer to our behavior or our conduct, the way that we behave. Let's notice several verses uh, that deal with this particularly. So remember, we're talking about walking naked. What does it mean to walk naked? It has something to do with our conduct or with our behavior, with our everyday life. Let's notice several verses where this meaning is used in Scripture for the word walk. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 uh, tells us the following. For we are His workmanship, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So notice, we are created for good works. That has to do with conduct and behavior. Now who prepared these works? Ah, let's continue reading. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we should walk in good works is what the Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. So in other words, the word walk has to do with our conduct in our daily lives. Notice also 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Here John wrote, He who says he abides in him, whoever says he abides in Jesus, what does he have to do? Ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So what is John saying here? He's saying that if we say that we are abiding in Jesus, we need to walk as Jesus walked. In other words, we need to conduct ourselves as Jesus conducted himself. We need to behave as Jesus behaved. Once again, the word walk is an action word. It's talking about our daily lives. It's talking about our works. It's talking about our conduct. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. It's speaking here about Enoch, and I want you to notice the special characteristic of Enoch, the first individual to be translated to heaven without seeing death. Hebrews 11 verse 5 reads, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found, because God had taken him. Now what hap notice what happened before. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that is, his, this witness, that he pleased God. Why did God take him to heaven? Because he pleased God. He lived a life or had a conduct that pleased God. Now, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24 refers to the same event, the same experience of the translation of Enoch to heaven. But there is a very important difference that shows us what it means to please God. Let's read Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. So why did, did God take Enoch? We're told that he took Enoch because Enoch walked with God. Oh, but Hebrews 11 verse 5 tells us that Enoch pleased God. So to please God means to walk with God. In other words, it means to behave, to conduct ourselves as true children of God. Now the Bible also speaks about the walking of the wicked. See, the wicked walk too, but they don't walk according to the conduct of Christ and of God. They walk according to this world. They walk according to works of wickedness. Let's notice a couple of verses on this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3. It's speaking about the Gentiles before they came to a knowledge of Christ. 
It says here in Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you, he's speaking to the Gentiles, He made alive, Jesus made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in other words, you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. How did the Gentiles walk before they came to Jesus? It says that they walked in trespasses and sins. In other words, their conduct was a sinful behavior. Notice verse 2, in, what's, in which you once walked, according to the course of this world. In other words, you walked like a worldling, according to the prince of the power of the air, in other words, in harmony with Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So notice once again, they walked in disobedience. They walked in trespasses and sins, according to the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan. Notice verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. So notice, walking has to do with conduct. Conducted ourselves, how did they do, conduct themselves? In the less, lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So you notice once again that walking has to do with our conduct and our behavior. If we come to Jesus, we would walk to G like Jesus walked. If we have not embraced Christ, we walk according to this world, we walk in trespasses and sins, we, we walk according to what the prince of the power of the air desires. Let's notice also Colossians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, where we find walking in a figurative sense. Here the Apostle Paul once again is speaking to Gentiles outside of Christ and what happened when they embraced Jesus. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, because of these things, because he's listed several evil things that they were practicing, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So who is the Apostle Paul talk about, talking about? He's talking about those who disobey, the disobedient. And then in verse 7 it says, In which you yourself, yourselves once walked when you lived in them. In other words, he's saying you once behaved, your conduct at one point was disobedience. But now he's saying you are walking in the Lord because he says in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So they weren't walking according to the sons of disobedience at that point when the Apostle Paul was writing to them. Let's read a passage that we find in Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, which is the message of Jesus Christ to the church of Sardis. This is a church that existed during the period of the Protestant Reformation. And here, once again, you're going to find the idea of the white garments, keeping the white garments so that you don't walk naked. Once again, I want to emphasize that you have to keep your garments. What does that mean? You know, some people say, well, once you've been justified, you have the white robe of Christ's righteousness, and from then on, there's no way that you can go astray. There's no way, there's no way that you can be lost. That is contrary to what Revelation 16, verse 15 is teaching. Revelation 16, verse 15 is telling us that we need to keep our garments. In other words, we receive the white garment and we need to keep the garment clean. We need to keep the garment white. So notice the message to the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 4. Here Jesus says, Therefore, if you will not watch, this is connected to Revelation 16, 15, same types of words are used. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So notice, this is very parallel to Revelation 16, verse 15. Jesus is saying, watch because I'm going to come as a thief. It's talking about the close of probation, either when a person dies or the corporate close of probation at the end of time. So Jesus says, I'm going to close the door of probation. And he says, watch, 
be awake, be alert, walk in the right path, for you know not what hour I will come upon you. Now notice verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. So notice he's saying, There's individuals who received garments in the past, and when Paul is writing, he says, they have not defiled their garments. And now notice the promise. And they shall, this is a future tense, and shall walk with me in in white, for they are worthy. So notice, they received the white garments, and then the Apostle Paul says, in his day, they have not defiled their garments, And then it says, because of this, they are going to walk in white. Now the garments are spiritual. It's the righteousness of Christ that covers the believer in Him. But if we have the righteousness of Christ now, spiritually speaking, if we have the character of Christ in our lives, this text is telling us that Jesus promises that in the future, we will be able to walk with Him in literal robes that are white. Because the robe that we received, we kept it white by our conduct and by our behavior, and therefore we will walk in white in the future. And then, of course, we have in verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Notice that the white garments have to do with overcoming. In fact, with every church, of the book of Revelation, it speaks about he who overcomes, he who overcomes. So it says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. What a beautiful promise of Jesus. So we receive the white robe when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. When we repent of our sins, we confess our sins, and we cry out for the righteousness of Christ, Jesus covers us with the robe of His righteousness. But then the robe must be kept clean, and if it is kept clean, then we will walk in literal white garments with Jesus in the kingdom come. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. This is speaking about the victorious church at the end of time. And you'll notice that uh, in this text, it says something very interesting in the context that we are discussing here. Let's read Revelation chapter 19 and we'll read verse 7 for the context, verse 7 and verse 8. It says there, let us be glad and rejoice, and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her, that is, the bride of Christ, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. Now, the white linen with which Jesus clothes the church, clothes the victorious church, It is uh, spiritual uh, in the sense that we are covered with the righteousness of Christ. But now notice how this is manifested in the life. It says in verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And then it explains what the fine linen is, what the white garments are. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Wow, that's interesting. Are you saying, Pastor Bohr, that the white garments are the righteous acts of the saints? How can that be? We thought that the white garments are the garments of the righteousness of Christ. And they are, by the way. But here it is speaking of the fruit of receiving the robe of Christ's righteousness. Now, Ellen White described the garment of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. By the wedding garment, in the parable is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. Wow! By the wedding garment in the parable, 
This is the, the parable of Matthew uh, chapter 22, uh, verse 1 and following. Is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of saints. Revelation 19 verse 8. It is the righteousness of Christ, His own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive Him as their personal Savior. You see, there is imputed righteousness or credited righteousness, and there is imparted righteousness, which has, which has to do with the fruit of the imputed righteousness. Jesus will not impute His righteousness to anyone who is not willing to be changed in life and live a conduct as Jesus lived His conduct. So the last part of this statement says, It is the righteousness of Christ, His own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive Him as their personal Savior. So you'll notice that the imparted righteousness is still the righteousness of Christ. Just like the imputed righteousness is still the righteousness of Christ. When probation closes, there will be a distinction between the evildoer and the righteous person. The evildoer will continue to do evil, whereas the righteous will continue to act or conduct himself right. We find this in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, which I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Revelation 22, verse 11 says, Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. When probation closes, which is what this verse is talking about, the evildoer will still continue to do evil, and the righteous will still continue to do right. Once again, the garment Yes, it represents the imputed righteousness of Christ, but it also represents the imparted righteousness of Christ, which leads us to keep our garments clean by the grace of Jesus Christ. The working faith of the righteous is not something that they come up with. It is as much the righteousness of Christ as is justification. Ellen White equates the fig leaf garment of Adam and Eve with nakedness and the deformity of sin. In other words, to cover ourselves with our own righteousness is equivalent to nakedness. This is the reason why when Adam and Eve sinned, they still felt naked and ashamed even after they had covered themselves with the fig leaves. You see, there is no uh, salvation in receiving, supposedly, the garment of Christ's imputed righteousness and then refusing to have the impartation of His righteousness to live a life in harmony with Jesus Christ, to conduct oneself as He conducted Himself. Let's notice here this fantastic uh, a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy on this point. By His perfect obedience, Jesus by His perfect obedience has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Now, I don't know how you cannot understand or misunderstand this statement of Ellen White. By His perfect obedience, in other words, by Christ's perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Now, how does that work out? She continues, When we submit ourselves to Christ, this is the key, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. 
the thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life. So it's not even our life. It's His life lived in us through the impartation of His righteousness. Then she continues, This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of His righteousness. Then as the Lord looks, uh, looks upon us, He sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but His own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. What a powerful statement that relates the uh, justification aspect of the Christian life and the sanctification aspect of the Christian life. Jesus will not justify anyone who is unwilling to be sanctified. He will not give us His imputed righteousness unless we are willing to receive His imparted righteousness. Now let's talk about righteousness by faith in verity. There's much talk these days in some circles about the 1888 message. In fact, Many, many books have been written on what happened in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the year 1888. I believe that many times uh, this message has been complicated by those who write. Entire volumes have been written on this. Now, what do I mean when I say that this message is complicated? Well, I want to read a statement that we find in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91 and 92. Here Ellen White speaks about the 1888 message, and this one paragraph, if we didn't have anything else, this one paragraph explains what the message of Jones and Wagoner was. <clears throat> this is how it reads. It, the 1888 message, presented justification through faith in the surety. So notice, it presented justification through faith in the surety. Jesus is the surety. In other words, you have faith in Jesus as your surety or as your substitute. Now notice, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ. Not our righteousness, not our good works, not legalism but the righteousness of Christ. But now notice the last part of the statement. To receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest. In other words, the righteousness of Christ is manifested in a certain way, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Did you catch that? The righteousness of Christ in us, is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, some years after the 1888 General Conference session, Ellen White explained the indispensability of both justification and sanctification for salvation. In Review and Herald, June 4, 1895, she wrote this, Righteousness within is testified by righteousness without. In other words, righteousness that you have within is testified by the life that you live. The statement continues, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. Now that word imputed is a theological word, and uh, basically what it means is credited to your account, attributed to you. doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Jesus. And so it says here in this statement, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. In other words, when I repent, truly repent, when I confess my sins, when I have real sorrow for sin, and I come to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I claim the promise that you will forgive my sin and that you will cleanse me from all unrighteousness and that you will take your righteousness and place it to my account. I believe that at that moment, Jesus imputes His righteousness to us. But there's more. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. But there's another righteousness, which is basically the same righteousness. 
the righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. So there is justifying righteousness and sanctifying righteousness. Both are the righteousness of Christ. We live His life and His righteousness is imputed to us or credited to our account. Both come from Him. Some people say, well, justification, uh, it, you know, th that makes us uh, worthy of heaven. Uh, sanctification is optional. It's not optional. God's people must have both in order to enter the kingdom. And you say, how is that? Let's continue the statement. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. In other words, our right to heaven. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. What a beautiful statement. So Christ's justifying righteousness is our title to heaven, whereas the sanctified life, the righteousness that is imparted, is our fitness for heaven. Now let me ask you this. Is anybody going to be able to go to heaven without the right to go to heaven, without the title to heaven, the justifying righteousness of Christ? Of course not. Is anyone going to be able to go to heaven without the fitness to be there? Without a character that has been sanctified by the power of Jesus Christ, by His imparted righteousness? Obviously not. You have to have both the title to heaven and the fitness for heaven. Let me uh, give you an illustration. Do you think that someone, perhaps, could go to the DMV and have a friend in the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that friend could get the individual a right to drive, in other words, a driver's license, even though the person doesn't know how to drive? Well, in these days, <laughs> you might say, yeah, it probably is possible if the friend in the Department of Motor Vehicles is a very good friend. The person could probably get the title to driving or the right to drive the driver's license without knowing how to drive. Does that entitle him to drive? Of course not. On the other hand, is it possible that someone knows how to drive, but they don't have a driver's license, they don't have the title or the right to drive? Of course, it works both ways. Let me ask you, if the individual gets a driver's license but doesn't know how to drive, does that qualify him to drive? No. And the opposite is also true. In order for us to enter heaven, we must have the imputed righteousness of Christ, which leads us out of sorrow for sin and a desire to be like Christ, to live a life similar to the life that Jesus lived. We cannot, we cannot duplicate the pattern, but we can copy the pattern according to to the spirit of prophecy. So the 1888 message is not a message of righteousness by faith alone in the sense of imputed righteousness alone. It also deals with obedience to all the commandments of God. 1888 was not a complicated message. Many times we complicate the message and we put all kinds of nuances in and we make it so complicated that many people can't even understand. Now, some people have misunderstood what Ellen White meant when she wrote that the message of righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And this will be our last point in our study today. You know, Ellen White did make a statement where she said that justification by faith is the third angel's message. Now let's read that statement. It's found in Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, just two years after the Minneapolis Conference, approximately. Here Ellen White wrote, Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. So people wrote to her and said, Is the message of Jones and Wagner, the message of righteousness by faith, is it the third angel's message? 
And the statement continues, And I have answered, It is the third angel's message in verity. And it, it is truly, Ellen White says, the message of righteousness by faith, the third angel's message. Now, when you read the third angel's message, uh, uh, if you are not careful in noticing the context as well as other texts of Scripture, you might think to yourself, how can the third angel's message be a message of righteousness by faith? Let's read the third angel's message as it is found in Revelation 14 and verses 9 through 12. This is speaking about the last generation in the world. When the beast, uh, through the help of the beast from the earth, raises up an image and commands everyone to worship the image and commands everyone to receive the mark of the beast. That is the context of the third angel's message. Notice what it says. Then a third angel followed them, that is the first two, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So notice, this is a dire warning of the Lord. The end time generation will not worship the beast, they will not worship the image, and they will not receive the mark of the beast. Now what relationship does this have with righteousness by faith? The, the message of righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. How do you explain this? Well, let's read the one verse that concludes this particular uh, passage that we just read from verses 9 through 11 of Revelation 14. Ah, there's a group that is not going to worship the beast, not going to worship the image, and not going to receive the mark of the beast. What characteristics do they have? Here is the patience of the saints. Now, what does that mean, the patience of the saints? Well, you know, really, uh, the translation page, patience does not capture the meaning of the Greek word, which is hupomone. It's the same word that is used in Matthew 24, he who endures or perseveres till the end will be saved. In other words, the first characteristic of this group is that they have the patience, the perseverance, the endurance of the saints which means this, this requires a continual walk with the Lord, a continual trust in Him. And then it gives a second characteristic. Here are those who what? Who keep the commandments of God. So notice those who will not end up, end up worshiping the beast, his image, and receiving the mark. They have the perseverance of the saints. They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Three characteristics of those who will remain faithful. The perseverance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God, and those who have the faith of Jesus. When you read this passage, you wonder what relationship the beast and his image and his mark has with righteousness by faith. It certainly is not merely describing forensic justification as Luther understood justification by faith. It is common for many Adventist scholars to define righteousness by faith in the same way that Martin Luther defined it. That is, the imputation of Christ's righteousness to those who trust in the merits of Jesus. Now, if this is true, then Martin Luther preached the third angel's message. I don't know if you're understanding my conclusion. If the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, and righteousness by faith is as Luther understood it, then Luther preached the third angel's message. 
but we know that Luther did not preach the third angel's message. Martin Luther lived hundreds of years before the third angel's message began to be proclaimed after the year 1844. So, we know that Martin Luther did not proclaim the third angel's message, because the first angel's message uh, was not uh, preached before the year 1798, in fact, not fully until the year after the year 1844. Now, how do we understand this then? It must mean that righteousness by faith not only has to do with righteousness by faith as Martin Luther and the Reformers understood it, but righteousness by faith must have a deeper, more profound, and more ample meaning and understanding. Ellen White wrote in the book uh, Great Controversy, page 356, the following about the first angel's message. No such message has ever been given in past ages. So notice she says the first angel's message was not given in past ages. She continues, Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. Paul didn't preach the first angel's message. He pointed to his brethren into the then distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. The reformers didn't proclaim the first angel's message. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But now notice, when could the first angel's message be proclaimed? Beginning in 1798. When would the second angel's message be proclaimed? 1842, when the Millerites gave the call, come out of the apostate churches. Then the third angel's message after 1844. So, notice once again, uh, the, the, um, no such message has ever been given in past ages, Ellen White states. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far, then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. Notice that Ellen White does not say that the third angel's message contains the message of righteousness by faith, but rather that it is the message of righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is not one element of the third angel's message, but rather permeates the entire message. So let's come back and examine the three key characteristics of those who will not worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. We find them in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. It tells us there that the final generation will have the perseverance of the saints. They will not give up. They will keep the commandments of God, all including the Sabbath commandment. And they will have the faith of Jesus. Now, these three concepts must be understood in the context of the previous verses, verses 9 through 11. Now, you notice that uh, Revelation chapter, not, uh, chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, brings to view the beast, his image, and his mark. So where do we find those three expressions earlier in the book of Revelation? The answer is we find them in Revelation chapter 13, and verses 11 to 18. So we have to go back to Revelation 13 to understand the third angel's message. Because Revelation 13, 11 to 18 speaks about the beast, it speaks about the image of the beast, and it speaks about the mark of the beast. So in, other, in order to understand Revelation 14, 9 through 11, we have to go back to Revelation chapter 13, 11 to 18. And what do we find there? We find there the greatest trial that God's people will experience in the history of the world. God's faithful children will have to refuse worship to the beast and his image 
and will have to refuse receiving the mark of the beast. At the risk of not being able to buy or sell. And these verses also tell us that eventually God's faithful people will face the death decree. What kind of persons must they be to go successfully through this severe trial, the greatest in the history of the world? The answer is they must have genuine faith in the surety in Jesus Christ, a faithful relationship with Him that will withstand hunger, thirst, bondage, and even the sentence of death. What will be the motivating, motivating force for keeping the commandments? Will they be legalists? No. This is where the faith of Jesus comes in. What is the faith of Jesus? It is, is it the faith in Jesus, or is it the faith, faith that Jesus had? I want to close by reading this one statement from Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 172, where Ellen White presents the balance between justification and sanctification, between keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus. This is how it reads. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance, the law and the gospel going hand in hand. She says, we've preached a lot about the need to obey the law, but we haven't preached about the gospel, which is receiving the imputed righteousness of Christ, which makes our law keeping acceptable in the sight of, of the Lord, because it is the imparted righteousness of Christ. Ellen White continues, I go once again to the beginning of this statement. The third angel's message is a proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed. But the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance, the law and the gospel going hand in hand. She continues, I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness, the faith of Jesus. It is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? She answers now, Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning Savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. And faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. What a magnificent statement. In other words, the faith of Jesus means having faith in Him in such a manner that we, when we repent and confess our sins and receive Him as Savior, He takes His righteousness and He places His righteousness to our account and He looks upon us as if we had never sinned. But notice in the third angel's message, that it doesn't only speak about the faith of Jesus, but it also speaks about the commandments of God, keeping the commandments of God. In other words, what we find is that when we are truly justified, when we truly receive the righteousness of Christ, and it is credited to our account, God's people will not only have the faith of Jesus, but God's commandment, God's people will also keep the commandments of God. I remind you once again of the statement that we read just a few moments ago where Ellen White explained what the message of 1888 was. It presented just justification through faith in the surety. It invited people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest uh, in obedience to all the commandments of God. So next time we will continue our study of righteousness by faith in the final conflict. Let's pray. Father, thank you for having been with us. Keep us now in your care 
and bless us as we continue to study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.